Hello and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and today I am really looking forward to having a discussion with you about one of the most requested mobsters I've had since I've started this channel and that's Ken Ito or Tokyo Joe. Ito's story is so filled with twists and turns that it seems like a movie. A heritage of samurai who grew up in the United States, was in an internment camp, ended up joining the Italian Mafia and being a high-ranking member despite his Japanese heritage, and then surviving an assassination attempt and burning the whole thing to the ground. Obviously, this is going to be a busy episode. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to that Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Ken Ito was born on October 19, 1919 in Stockton, California to Mamoru and Kura Ito. He came from a large family with six siblings. His father, a Japanese war veteran who descended from samurai, found work as a farmhand and foreman before becoming a preacher who, after converting to Christianity while living in San Francisco, the family is reported to have moved frequently. It's also reported that his father, like his mother, a first-generation immigrant, was very against what he saw as the sinful nature of his fellow Asian American immigrants and would become quite strict as a result, forcing their children to live a very disciplined lifestyle. The family ultimately settled in Los Angeles, you know, the place in the United States most known for Christian wholesomeness, where Ito would grow resentful toward his parents' style of upbringing. Ito's mother was depressed and his father was abusive, both physically and emotionally. Ken was the only one of his siblings who would stand up to his father, and this often resulted in physical injury. Ito would not make it past the eighth grade at Virgil Junior High School in Los Angeles before dropping out and running away from home. It's reported that he would move to Portland, Oregon, but I had a hard time confirming that particular piece of information. We do know that he registered for the draft on July 1st, 1941, when he was living in Seattle, Washington. Seattle, Washington was also his last place of residence listed when he was interned, like many Japanese Americans by Executive Order 9066 during World War II. Executive Order 9066 of course refers to the executive order that saw the creation and filling of internment camps for Japanese Americans and immigrants after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Although widely and rightly considered a black eye in the history of American executive orders, Executive Order 9066 did provide us some interesting information about Ken Ito. From his registration we learned that Ken Ito, despite being only a second generation American, only spoke, wrote, and read English. He had never been to Japan, nor did he have any familiarity with the language. I'm doing some inferring here, but to me, that sounds like their home was very strict about adopting the culture of their new country, and it was forbidden to speak Japanese in the home. Either that, or Ito really didn't pay attention to the conversations had in his home, and he was only interested in American culture. To me, the former seems more likely based on the information we have about his upbringing. From his internment record, by the way, his number was 16702A, and he was located at the Minidoka War Relocation Center in Idaho. We learned that he was unmarried at the time, considered himself an atheist, despite what seemed like a pressure campaign from his father, and that he had previous work experience as a semi-skilled meat cutter, although no experience in slaughterhouses or meatpacking companies, as well as a farmhand and a waiter. He also showed a propensity for sports and athletics, which would fit in with his career as head of the major Chicago gambling operations later on in his life. In fact, it was during his time in this internment camp that the uneducated, although intelligent, Ito found his calling. It's reported that not only did he get in trouble for curfew violations, but these violations were also coupled with the crime of running a poker operation. He was a very talented gambler, and Ito would use this time in the internment camp to hone his skill as somebody who could run a gambling operation. I suppose he didn't really have much else to do. After the war was over, Ito would make his way to Chicago to start an official career as a gambler and making a way of life of it by 1947. Just before we narratively leave the Japanese internment camp, I should note that there are rumors that suggest that Ken Ito got out of this camp by suggesting that he was Chinese and not Japanese. I could not corroborate this story, and I find it unlikely, but it is kind of one of those funny tidbits that you see on the internet. Seeing how much of a knack he had for this business, Ito would move to Denver, Colorado, where he would find work as a dealer in the Oriental Club Casino. That does seem a little on the nose for Ito to work at the Oriental Club, although it was 1949 and racial sensitivity and sensibilities weren't quite what they are today. Ito didn't stay in Denver long. He would move back to Chicago in order to start up a Bolita operation. As you'll recall, Bolita, meaning little ball in Spanish, is the underground lottery that was the starting job for many mobsters in this era. 
Ito was able to jump into this racket so quickly, because when he had first arrived in Chicago, he had become such a successful gambler. So much so that he was noticed by the outfit men who protected the card games, most notably Sam Giancana, Joey Ayupa, and Vince Solano, for whom Ito would eventually work in the outfit. Giancana, Ayupa, and Solano, and their associates would then force Ito to pay a street tax on his earnings, as they were so numerous. Ito complied. Impressed by Ito's proficiency at gambling, they were the men who assisted him in setting up his incredibly successful Bolita operation. And getting a cut for themselves, of course. Ito's Bolita operation was running between $150,000 to $250,000 per week at its height, with a $3,000 a week payoff to Chicago's finest. When you see numbers like that, it's easy to see how someone who wasn't particularly preoccupied with being an upstanding citizen, heck, even somebody who was just down on his luck, could fall for the siren call of organized crime. In fact, when the FBI finally did take note of Ito, they considered him to be on the same level as Meyer Lansky in New York. It's even suggested that Ito had a loose association with Lansky himself, because when Lansky was setting up gambling operations in the Bahamas, it was Ito who was trusted with employing the casino operators and setting up the gambling tables. Ito was listed by the FBI as a sleeper in the underworld early in his career. However, later it was discovered that Ito was actually treated like a don when he would travel around the country to set up these gambling operations. At some point, Ito would also supplement his gambling income with the sale of opium. We know he was in Honolulu, Hawaii in the summer of 1949 through which Oriental opium dealers had an easier time getting the substance into the United States. We also know that he took United Airline Flight number 648 on August 1st, 1949, from Honolulu, Hawaii, to San Francisco, California. It seems plausible to me that this Honolulu connection was perhaps the start of Ito's short-lived time as an opium dealer. In fact, he was arrested soon after and convicted on October 11th, 1950, for obtaining money under false pretenses. He faced 14 years behind bars and would even sign a statement explaining that he, and two colleagues, would obtain bad opium from a shifty dealer. It turned out that it wasn't opium, and one of the colleagues was under the impression that Ito and his other colleague had tricked him into giving them his portion of the money for faulty purchases. Ito insists that this wasn't true, but the charge of obtaining money under false pretenses started there. This all allegedly took place in Pocatello, Idaho in the spring of 1950. By September 12th, 1951, Ito was released on parole, and this seemed to be the end of his time as a drug dealer. Ito felt that it was best to stay in his lane and become a gambling mogul, and based on the trajectory of his career, I would say that he bet on the right horse. Ito would go back to his successful Chicago gambling operations, and this is when the FBI would start to take a little bit of notice of him, although he had kind of been on their radar since early 1949. By the end of Ito's career as a criminal, it's reported that the FBI files on him could actually be stacked up to a foot tall. Ito's first wife, Teresa, was also a gambler and helped him early on in his career. It's reported that she might have actually been the one to introduce him to many in Chicago's underworld. Ito would marry three times in his life and father six children. His second wife, Jen, would give birth to his son, Steve, who has been the most outspoken about his father, and his third wife, Mary Lou, would spare him from one hit attempt later in his life because she would drive him to his destination and therefore interrupt the plan to take him out. We'll definitely talk about the assassination plan that took place after Mary Lou's unintentional interruption, but we'll get to that toward the end of the video. Despite Ito's appearance, it's noted that he was considered quite dangerous and violent. He would later in his life admit to orchestrating at least four murders, and if that's something he was willing to fess up to, we can assume that that number is much higher. He would be suspected of calling for multiple unsolved murders, the victims being gamblers unable to pay back their debts to him throughout the 1950s and 1960s. The victims shared similar fates. They were taken from their homes and driven to vacant lots, where their throats would be slit and they would be disemboweled. He was known, of course, to work with the Chicago outfit, but also teamed up with Black and Puerto Rican gangs in the Chicago area. Being a Japanese-American himself, Ito had quite an eclectic group of co-workers. Ito was a dependable moneymaker and favored among the leadership class of the Chicago outfit. In fact, Ito is the only Japanese-American to be a made member in the Chicago outfit. It certainly wasn't all racial harmony and rainbows in these partnerships. The nickname Tokyo Joe, among others which I will not share on this channel for fear of being censored by YouTube, aside. Despite Ito's dependability and consistency, criminal organizations, particularly at this time but certainly into today, were strictly divided by race. Sure, there were outliers like Ito and Gus the Greek Alex, but ultimately, if you were going to be in the inner circle, it was expected that you would be Italian. I have no doubt that the heightened racial tension had just about everything to do with the outfit's ultimate 
opinion of Ido when push came to shove, but once again, I'm going to tease that for the end because it really does get pretty juicy at the end. After the John F. Kennedy assassination, federal officials very much suspected the Chicago Outfit's involvement. They would actually bring Ido in and question him about Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby. Ito did not seem to know anything about this and was ultimately not useful, but it's still interesting to think that federal officials believed there was at least enough of a connection to question Ito about a presidential assassination. It seems that Ito would also get caught up in a $300,000 bankruptcy fraud in Alexandria, Virginia around this time as well. By the 1970s, Ito was the owner of Taco C. Incorporated in Skokie, Illinois and by extension, a second connected company known as Caliendo's Finer Foods. This business specialized in freezing and distributing frozen food, particularly Mexican food, hence the name Taco C. The suspicion was that this was a front, and presumably Ito was using the business's legitimacy to launder money before pumping up the stock price and selling it off. I would also just like to add that this business would have been perfect for shipping illegal substances or prostitutes across state lines illegally, but Ito was in neither business, and I kind of saw this as a missed opportunity for the Chicago outfit. From FBI reports, the relationship with Taco C was suspicious because Ito did not actually appear on business records, but could be seen wearing a meat smock, giving orders to employees, and going in and out of any offices he pleased without knocking. That sure sounds like ownership to me. Although to be fair, Ito did have experience as a meat cutter, even in his days in the internment camp. So it's not as if this is one of those waste management or construction jobs that we often see used by mobsters with no experience in the field obtaining a high position. It was at this meat freezing business that people referred to him as Joe, and it's likely from here that the name Tokyo Joe stemmed. There was one notable violation in which 600 pounds of uninspected meat was shipped illegally. This could have had a felony charge attached. More than the inspection violation, it would appear that the suspicion of money laundering was certainly correct, as one witness noted that this business was only making about $4,000 a month in sales, but in order to pay their variety of expenditures, that the company would have had to have made at least $40,000 a month to even crack the nut, as he put it. They also kept two broken down trucks on the property, which they listed as assets on their tax information. Ito was known to have used his own nightclub, the Tony Paris Show Lounge Incorporated, to purchase products from Taco C in order to boost sales. Overdrafts occurred frequently in this business, and they were always covered by Ito himself. In one case, he even covered a $20,000 overdraft. That didn't stop this company from continuing to operate. They would pay off any debts incurred, and were even having meetings with Vienna Sausages to strike a deal wherein Vienna would buy them out. That seemed like a promising business prospect at the time in 1972. By 1973, however, the business seemed to turn around, and Ida was officially listed as the company's corporation controller, with a $400 a week salary as his association with the business had grown far too evident. However, the FBI was certainly onto the game at this point, recognizing Ido's operation of this business for what it was, a stock sham wherein Ido would inflate the value of the business, sell stocks, and walk away. There was too much heat, however, and by the end of 1973, the IRS had begun auditing Taco C, which would shortly thereafter close its doors in November. Ultimately, this case was dropped by the FBI and handed over to the IRS, which would cause a plague of issues for Ito throughout all of his life. However, one of the things indicated by the diaries of one of the men Ito had violently threatened to kill unless he relinquished business records for Ito to more accurately cook the books with Taco C was that Ito's outfit boss, Ross Prio, could be implicated by his mishandling of this operation. By the way, Vince Solano, Ito's direct boss, was the trusted bodyguard and driver for Northside boss Prio himself. Ito's connection was a very intricate one in the outfit. Despite this information and high rank in the outfit, the FBI always assumed that Ito was a successful but small potatoes player in the outfit, since there was no way that a man of Japanese ancestry could possibly be that influential in Chicago's Italian outfit. It was because of this doubt that they assigned new FBI agent Elaine Corbett Smith to Ito's case. Smith, a new agent from Chicago, eager to work in the organized crime unit to bring down the biggest illegal operation from her hometown, was largely dismissed by the Bureau since she was new and, of course, a woman. So to satisfy her desire to work in the organized crime unit, they sent the rookie girl agent to work on the Ken Ito case, who was surely nothing because he wasn't Italian. The FBI would underestimate both Agent Smith and Ito, 
resulting in a shock for everyone when she blew the lid off Ito's case and exposed just how powerful he really was. Smith started at the FBI in 1979, having previously worked as a fourth grade teacher. And you should never underestimate a teacher's ability to sniff out the truth. Anybody who was a troublemaker in school should be able to attest to this. Basically all that's known about the depth of Ito's influence comes from Agent Smith's work. Smith has gone on to write a book about her experience and provide interviews. I have these linked in the description under my sources if you'd like to check them out. Her book, A Gun in My Gucci, Two Outsiders Take Down the Chicago Mob, is an excellent book if you'd like to know more about Agent Smith and her work in the FBI, specifically regarding the takedown of Ito. I could spend probably 20 minutes talking about Agent Smith. I think she's a terrific role model, especially for young girls. If you have daughters or granddaughters that you would like to share your love of organized crime with, I highly recommend starting with the story of Ken Ito and what happened with Agent Smith. Anyway, by 1983, enough information had been gathered on Ito and his operations to land a gambling charge conviction. Nervous that Ito would strike some kind of plea deal or agreement with the government to turn state's evidence for leniency on the gambling charges, Vince Solano, who had previously worked under Ross Prio, called Ito in for a meeting. Prio died of natural causes in 1972. After Prio's death, Solano took over as the big cheese of the North Side, and he was the union president of Local Union 1 of the Laborers International Union of North America, which was basically just a front to run gambling, extortion, and prostitution operations. Anyway, back to the story, Solano called Ito in for a meeting because he was nervous that Ito was going to squeal. This, from what I understand, was attributed to the fact that Ito was Japanese and not Italian. Ito's record as a good earner who kept his mouth shut didn't mean anything when Solano was nervous. It all came down to racial fears. In fact, Ito had been extremely firm with Agent Smith that he had no interest in talking. She recalls the conversation when as follows. Smith said, You know, Mr. Ito, we would very much like you to cooperate with us. We need the help of people like you to defeat the outfit. And Ito answered, I understand, Agent Smith, that you have a job to do, and trying to convince me to snitch is part of it. But that is not who I am. I know I may go to prison for some time. But I could do that standing on my head. I will never cooperate. Despite Ito's proven loyalty and his insistence to Solano that he would never ever talk, Solano called a hit for Ito. Solano would use hitmen Jasper Campis and Joe Gattuso to get the job done. Solano invited Ito to dinner with him, which was supposed to be Ito's last supper. Ito was to pick up Campis and Gattuso, then meet up with Solano for dinner. Campis and Gattuso would have Ito drive to the alleged meeting. When they arrived, Campis and Gattuso would fire three shots into Ito's head, creating a bloody mess before they ran away from the scene of the crime. Okay, so three bullets in the head, that's the end of Tokyo Joe, right? Wrong. Ito, miraculously, survived its murder attempt. After surviving the second gunshot, he played possum with the third. The bullets never pierced his skull, and despite making quite a bloody spectacle that would have convinced anyone that he had died, Ito survived with merely flesh wounds. He would stumble into a pharmacy where the pharmacist would call an ambulance for him. After this murder attempt, Ito would turn to the FBI for protection, with the only stipulation being that he worked with Elaine Smith. Smith was happy to oblige, and Ito would expose Solano's north side operations and crack wide open the operations of the Chicago outfit. Ito has frequently received media titles such as the man who took down the outfit, or one of the most significant leaks in the outfit's history, who was the starting point of Operation Sunup. This operation, named in reference to the Japanese flag, refers to the various successes the FBI had against the outfit and corruption in the Chicago PD based on Ito's revelations. Campis and Gattuso were arrested shortly after Ito had recovered in the hospital. In 1985, Ito would ultimately give his testimony with his face covered like a medieval executioner to protect his identity as he remained in witness protection. Campis and Gattuso were not in jail long before outfit associates posted their bail. Typically, it's a good sign if the outfit is invested enough in you to bail you out, but in this case, the outfit wanted them out of jail so that they could take care of them. Campis and Gattuso's bodies would be found in the back of a car on July 14, 1983, just five months after they had posted bail. Choked, stabbed, beaten, and bloated, their bodies were certainly a gruesome sight to behold and a clear message from the outfit. They would not tolerate this type of mistake. Ida believed that Vince Solano had even had these men brought to his own home so that he could torment and murder them himself. We'll never know for sure because Solano died of natural causes before this was ever brought to court. But Solano was one of the only mobsters to escape unscathed from Operation Sunup, and the only escape 
was death. Ito's testimony was directly linked to the arrests and sentencings of Joey the Clown Lombardo, Angelo the Hook La Pietra, Jackie the Lackey Cerrone, Joseph Little Caesar de Varco, and even Joey Ayupa. After all of this fallout, Ito would enter the witness protection program under the name Joe Tanaka. He would spend his remaining years living with his daughter in Hawaii, where he was able to go fishing every morning, one of his favorite hobbies. Shortly after he entered the witness protection program, his son was approached by mafiosi and offered $10,000 to give up his father's location. Which, frankly to me, seems like an insulting offer. You want me to turn on my flesh and blood for $10,000? And this was even in 1983, that seems like small potatoes. What gives with that? Anyway, Ido lived with his family in Oahu for a short while before ultimately moving back to the United States mainland and settling in Atlanta, Georgia. Just to end a rumor I saw briefly online during this research, it seems that some people believe that the wrestler who was named Professor Tanaka, real name Charles J. Kalani Jr., was Ito's son. This is simply untrue. However, it should be noted that Kalani did act in the 1991 B-movie Alligator 2 Mutation, playing a character named Joe with the wrestler name of Tokyo Joe in the film. Ito and Agent Smith remained friends throughout his entire life, Ito's daughter even let her know that he thought of her as his own daughter. After his return to Atlanta, Ito would live to the ripe age of 84 years old before he began a battle with cancer that landed him in hospice and ultimately took his life on January 23rd, 2004. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing the fascinating life of Ken Tokyo Joe Ito. Ito was one of those rare mobsters. Not only was he Japanese and got into the Italian mafia, the only one to do that, but that limited him, but then he was able to make it into the rare winner circle of mobsters who turn state's witness and then live to tell the tale, and the even rarer winner circle of somebody who's been shot in the head three times, then turned against the mafia, and then learned to tell the tale and lived a long life. He was a very exceptional person in the Chicago outfit. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about Tokyo Joe. Also, don't forget to utilize that comment section and social media to let me know about who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.